Welcome to the last lesson in the chapter Electrical Properties of a Solar Cell. This unit will deal with the loss mechanisms in a solar cell. In the last lecture, we have seen that there is a physical limit to the efficiency of a solar cell. We learned about the shockley quizer limit, which describes the maximum efficiency as a function of the band gap. In addition, we have seen that no real solar cell of any technology reaches the maximum efficiency. In this learning unit, we will look at the losses that prevent maximum efficiency from being achieved and what engineers can do to minimize them. First of all, let's take a look at what a finished solar cell actually looks like. Here we see the pn junction of a solar cell with front contacts at the top and rear contact at the bottom. In this solar cell, the p-type area is on the bottom and the n-type area is on the top. There are also solar cells that are built the other way around. But this structure corresponds to the today's standard. The n-layer is also referred to as emitter and the p-layer is base. You have probably noticed that the base is significantly thicker than the emitter. We'll deal with the reason for that later. Now let's look at what happens when photons with sufficient energy for the photo effect hit the solar cell. In the best case, the photon is absorbed in the semiconductor and a free electron hole pair is created. The electron and the hole are each transported to the contacts and generate a current flow in an external circuit. But unfortunately, there are a number of things that can go wrong and prevent that current from flowing. At first, it can happen that the photon hits one of the front contacts instead of the semiconductor and is either reflected or absorbed by the contact. Here we talk about shading losses. It also can happen that the photon hits the semiconductor but it is reflected by it. We call this reflection losses. Finally, a photon can cross the semiconductor without being absorbed. Unfortunately, this also occurs with photons which actually have enough energy for the photo effect. These are transmission losses. We summarize the losses mentioned so far under optical losses. There are also electrical losses, which occur when an electron hole pair is generated, but no external current flows. We have already dealt to some extent with these losses. Electrons and holes in the semiconductor can recombine before they reach the contacts. We call this case recombination losses. Second, there are ohmic losses. We already looked briefly at the ohmic losses in the second unit of this chapter. Remember the parallel and especially the serious resistance of the solar cell. Ohmic losses occur not only in the semiconductor itself but also in the contacts. The losses described here play a role for uh, all solar cell technologies. Therefore, we will discuss them in more detail and also show strategies which, with which these losses can be minimized. In the next two chapters, we'll look in detail at how losses are reduced in practice for the various technologies. Let's first turn to the shading losses. The metal front electrode is opaque to the incident light so that the area covered by the front electrode reduces the active area of the solar cell. The larger the area of the contacts, the greater the losses due to shading. But accordingly, in order to reduce the shading losses, attempts are made to reduce the area of the contact as much as possible. However, as we shall see later, a smaller contact area is associated with greater ohmic losses, so that the scope here is limited and a compromise or optimum must be found. The shading losses correspond to the ratio of the width of the contacts to their distance. Note that the distance between the fingers is measured from the center of one finger to the center of the next. Let us now consider the case that the photon hits the semiconductor and not the contacts, but is reflected by it. To understand this, we need to study the phenomena of reflection in a little more detail. From a physical point of view, reflection occurs when light hits a boundary layer 
between two materials with a different refractive index n. The refractive index is a measure of how fast light can propagate in a material. It indicates the amount by which the speed of light beam deviates from the speed of light in a vacuum. Air, for example, has a refractive index of 1, so light propagates in air as quickly as in vacuum. Silicon, on the other hand, has a refractive index of 4, so light propagates much more slowly here. Whenever light moves to a material with a different refractive index, a portion of the light is reflected. The greater the difference between the refractive indices of two materials, the stronger the reflection. We define the proportion of the reflected light as the reflection coefficient, or reflectance, r. For the special case of normal incident of light, we can calculate the reflectance using the equation shown here. For the reflection at the boundary between air and silicon, the equation results in a reflectance of 0.36, that means 36% of the perpendicular incident radiation is reflected. That is a lot. It should be mentioned that the refractive index of a material depends on the wavelength of the light. This can be seen, for example, when light is refracted in a prism. Since the refractive index is wavelength dependent, light of different wavelengths is refracted for different degrees by a prism thereby splitting the light into the spectral colors. As a result, the de degree of reflection is a function of the wavelengths too. Shown here is the reflectance of silicon for per perpendicular incidence of light. It can be seen that the reflectance is even greater at smaller wavelengths and is even almost 50% at 400 nanometer. Now there are some approaches to reduce reflection. One approach that is almost always used is coating with a very thin anti-reflective layer. If such a layer is applied to a solar cell, we no longer, no longer have one but two boundary layers. One from air to the anti-reflective layer and one from the anti-reflective layer to the solar cell. As just explained, the incident light is reflected at both boundary layers. Basically, the trick now consists in shifting the waves of the two reflected beams towards one another in such a way that they neutralize one another. To do this, they have to be phase shifted by 180 degrees. In this case, a wave trough of the first light beam hits a wave crest of the second light beam and the two waves cancel out each other out. We also speak of destructive interference. In order for the two reflected waves to completely cancel out each other, the amplitudes must be the same. The reflection at the first boundary layer must therefore be just as great as that one at the second boundary layer. We have just learned that we can calculate the reflection at a boundary layer with the equation shown here. Since R1 and R2 must be the same, we can derive the following requirements for the refractive index of the anti-reflective layer. Here N2 is the refractive index of the substrate, in our case silicon, and N0 the refractive index of the material above the anti-reflective layer, usually this is air or glass. A material with such an optimum refractive index N1 would ensure that the amplitudes of the two reflected beams are the same. Now let's look at the second condition, a phase shift of 180 degree. A phase shift of 180 degree corresponds to a shift of the sine wave by half lambda. This phase shift can be achieved most easily if the layer thickness is chosen so that the path length of the reflected beam in the anti-reflected la layer is exactly half the wavelength. Since the path length through the anti-reflective layer depends on its refractive index, the optimum layer thickness results from the equation shown here. Let's summarize. First of all, a material has to be found whose refractive index comes as close as possible to the optimal refractive index. 
once this material has been found, the layer thickness is calculated so that complete destructive interference occurs at a certain wavelength. Theoretically, it is possible to reduce the reflection for this single wavelength to zero. At other wavelengths, however, the phase shift will deviate from 180 degrees. The reflected waves will still interfere destructively, but they won't cancel each other out completely. The reflectance is therefore somewhat higher if we look at the mean reflection over all wavelengths. The material for the antireflective layer depends on the surrounding materials. The optimal reflective index for a solar cell under air is different from that for a solar cell under glass. Glass can of course also be coated with an antireflective layer. The aim here would be to minimize the reflection between glass and air. Silicon nitride is often used as the antireflective layer material for the solar cell. With such an antireflective coating, the reflection on silicon solar cells can be reduced from 36% previously to less than 6%. Another way to reduce reflection is to texturize the surface. For this purpose, the surface of the solar cell is especially roughened. The effect is exactly the opposite of polishing, which creates a shiny or reflective surface. The technique for roughening differs depending on the solar cell technology, as the different materials require very different approaches. Here we take a look at the effect of a texturing using the example of a pyramid-shaped surface. Such a texture can be achieved with monocrystalline silicon solar cells. As we have just learned, a light beam that hits the smooth, non-roughened surface of a solar cell is reflected by 36%. If this light beam hits a pyramid, it also partly ref is reflected by this. Let's assume that the reflection is also 36% here, although we have no perpendicular incidence of light. The trick behind the texturing is that the reflected beam hits the surface of a, sec a second time and thus has a second chance to be absorbed. Let us assume that 30% of the light is reflected here as well. In sum, the reflection loss is only 36% of 36%, that is 12% of the light. With texturing, the reflection can be significantly reduced. In practice, both methods, texturing and coating, with an antireflective layer, are often used together. In the case of silicon, the total remaining reflection loss then is only a few percent. We have now seen how reflection occurs on a solar cell and how we can minimize it as far as possible. Now let's look at the next loss mechanism, the transmission of photons. So far we as have assumed that every photon with sufficient energy creates an electron hole pair in the semiconductor. As I indicated in the beginning, in reality this is not the case. Let us examine this in more detail. Let us consider a monochromatic light beam hitting an absorbing material. Monochromatic means that the light beam only contains light of a single wavelength. Some of the photons are absorbed in the material, so the light beam behind the material consists of fewer photons and accordingly has lower intensity. With increasing the thickness of the material, the number of photons that are absorbed in the material also increase. The probability with which a photon is absorbed is described by the lambert bayer law. According to this law, the absorption of light in a material can be described by the absorption coefficient alpha. The unit of the absorption coefficient alpha is 1 per centimeter. Similar to reflection, we define the transmittance as the ratio of the intensity of transmitted light to the intensity of incident light. For the transmittance, there is an exponential relationship to the absorption coefficient. According to this equation, the assumption that every photon with sufficient energy absorbed can only apply if the semiconductor either has a sufficient thickness or a very large absorption coefficient. The absorption depth 
can be derived from the absorption coefficient. This corresponds to the reciprocal of the absorption coefficient. If you put the absorption depth 1 divided by alpha into the equation for the transmittance, we see that the transmission for a material of this thickness is exactly 1 divided by E, so 37%. The absorption depth of a solar cell is an important parameter as it provides information about how thick the solar cell has to be in order for a large part of the radiation to be absorbed. Similar to the reflectance, there again is a dependency on the wavelengths for absorption and transmission. If we consider light of different wavelengths, we see that a certain material has different absorption coefficients at different wavelengths. Let's take a closer look at silicon as an example. Alpha is plotted against the wavelengths on a logarithmic scale. As we can see, alpha drops by around seven orders of magnitude between the blue spectral range and the cutoff wavelengths. The diagram of the absorption depth is exactly the opposite. While the absorption depth in the blue range is only a few micrometers, beyond the cutoff wavelength it is many kilometers. The simple conclusion could now be to make a solar cell very thick in order to be able to absorb all photons. In practice, this is opposed to the requirements for the lowest possible material consumption. And last but not least, the next problem arises directly with large semiconductor thicknesses, the recombination of charge carriers, which becomes more likely the longer the path through the semiconductor is. We'll come back to this point in a short moment. First, let's take a look at what other options there are to reduce transmission losses. Various approaches are used to reduce transmission losses. They all have in common that they keep the photons in the semiconductor for as long as possible. This is also called light trapping. One possibility is to texture the surface, as we have already learned in the case of reflection. The vertically incident light rays are refracted downwards at an angle by the texture and thus downwards through the texture and thus travel a longer path through the cell. In addition, a reflective material can be applied to the back of the cell so that the light is reflected and thrown back into the semiconductor. As already mentioned, the thickness of the semiconductor is limited by the recombination of charge carriers. When charge carriers recombine inside the semiconductor, they cancel each other out. The probability for this process depends largely on the concentration of the majority charge carriers. In the P region, the holes are the majority charge carriers. An electron, therefore, only has a limited lifespan, lifespan in the P region before it accidentally hits a hole and recombines with it. The average path that an electron can travel in the P region towards the P injunction within its lifetime is called the diffusion length. If the contacts are further away than the electron's diffusion length, the probability that it will recombine is very high. It therefore makes no sense to choose the thickness of the semiconductor greater than the diffusion length of the electrons. In order to achieve the greatest possible diffusion lengths, very pure semiconductors are required. In addition, the diffusion length also depends on the doping. A low doping means a low majority carrier concentration. The recombination inside the semiconductor is also referred to as bulk recombination. In addition to the bulk recombination, we also have to take a closer look at the recombination on the surface. Here you can see a highly magnified representation of the edge area of a solar cell. In contrast to the inside of the semiconductor, silicon atoms at the surface do not find an atom for the force bond. These so-called dangling bonds cause additional states in the band gap through which electrons and holes can recombine. In addition, foreign atoms like dirt or moisture can settle here. Because of this, the surface of the solar cell is a place with a particularly high level of recombination. 
In order to reduce surface recombination, attempts are made to reduce the number of unbound silicon atoms. For this purpose, a layer, for example made of silicon nitride or silicon dioxide, is applied to the surface. This saturates the free bonds on the surface. This is called passivation. An anti-reflective layer often fulfills the function of a passivation. Let us now turn to the final loss. Let us assume that everything has gone well so far. A photon with the appropriate energy hits the semiconductor. It is absorbed and creates a free charge carrier pair that makes its way to the contacts without recombining. However, these charge carriers experience an electrical resistance on their way through the semiconductor and through the contacts, which leads to losses. There are a number of technologies for contacting the solar cells, which sometimes differ greatly from one another. We will therefore come back to this point again in the next two chapters. At this point I would just like to give you a brief insight into the topic, as it always plays a role in the overall view of the losses. Let's take a look at a typical contact grid of a silicon solar cell. This usually consists of several thicker bus bars that are connected to many thin contact fingers. Here you see a schematic representation of the greatly enlarged contact grid. In the middle you can see the bus bars and starting from it the contact fingers. The contact fingers have an ohmic resistance which depends on the length, the width and the height of the fingers. The smaller the cross section and the width times the height of the contact finger, the greater the resistance and with it the losses. In order to get to the contact fingers, however, the electrons first have to travel through the emitter. Compared to the contact fingers, the emitter has a relatively poor conductivity. It can be shown that the ohmic losses in the emitter increase with the third power of the finger spacing S. In order to reduce the ohmic losses, one would choose the contact fingers on the one hand as wide and high as possible and on the other hand keep the finger spacing small. However, this is counteracted by the shading of the solar cell. You remember, the shading reduces the active area of the solar cell. The shading losses correspond to the ratios of finger width to finger spacing. When optimizing the contact grid, both the shading losses and the ohmic losses in the emitter and the contact fingers must therefore be taken into account and be weighed against one another. Another conclusion would be to keep the contact fingers as short as possible, which is only possible if the number of bus bars is increased. Here the same considerations apply as for the contact fingers. Shading losses and ohmic losses must be weighed against each other. We have seen in this teaching unit that there are a number of losses in a solar cell that reduce efficiency. The most important losses include shading, reflection, transmission, recombination in the semiconductor, recombination at the surface and ohmic losses in the emitter and the contacts. In the next chapters we will talk about different types of solar cells. Since their market share is over 90%, we will first look at crystalline silicon solar cells in the next chapter. The fourth chapter will then deal with other photovoltaic technologies such as synfilm technologies. I thank you for your attention.